Okay, let's let's move on. I'm gonna have uh, Gail take the lead on uh, this because we're gonna sw switch gears and talk about the 20% of AML patients that have um, uh, mutations of IDH. Gail? Well, the, the land of IDH, you know, brought us back to um, all of our nightmares of organic chemistry and the Krebs cycle and everybody kind of got through that year where, oh my God, we actually have to learn this again. And everybody took their meds and learned about IDH inhibitors. And there was an incredible, so revolution number one was the identification, of course, of the um, mutations in AML. Then all of a sudden, wait a minute, AML, relapsed AML isn't necessarily completely the land of the lost. We have been suffering so enormously with were therapies for patients with relapsed AML. We have been pummeling them for decades with lots of different chemotherapy combinations without success. And then there are data emerging for ivocidinib um, and for enosidinib, ivocidinib being um, a potent IDH1 inhibitor, an orally available drug, enosidinib, an orally available inhibitor um, of mutant IDH2, showing actually quite high response rates as well as durable remissions as single agent, pretty well tolerated drugs in relapsed AML, not curing the patients. We are not talking years in remission, but we are talking durable remissions in the, you know, six to 12 month zone with a single agent. Toxicity profile has been um, a little bit glitchy for these drugs. You have to watch for differentiation syndrome, which we'll talk about a little bit. You have to look at QT, but basically these are orders of magnitude different from standard chemotherapies. They have better response rates than chemo in these groups. And we thought, okay, this is huge. Let's move them to the upfront setting. So there, we also had some interesting data. The ivocidinib trial allowed some patients with newly diagnosed um, disease to be treated. And actually there's a CRCRH of about 40-ish percent in those patients. Some of those, if you look at the swim plots, were actually durable remissions. These are patients who might not actually have been offered anything. They were the patients that you're talking about, Harry, who were older and may have fallen into the nihilism trap of, oh, you can't get anything. And yet here they are in a durable remission. Mission. So the data are very similar, similar for enosidinib. So these are single agents that can be used both up front and in relapse disease to be remitters. They induce remission. So of course, then the question is, what about combining them with um, standard chemotherapy? What about combining them with azacitidine? But actually, the world was moving at the same time. And what we started seeing as this tremendous success was evolving was that actually venetoclax was particularly effective in the IDH subgroups, in IDH1 and IDH2. So this is confusing, and I'm sure you're going to want to initiate some discussion about this, because now you have choices. Well, how do I pick a combination of venetoclax and azacitidine or ivocidinib and azacitidine, or which one? We have a little bit of, a, um, of too many choices. And I would say the summary that we've seen so far out of, um, uh, out of EHA and out of ASCO, so we know that ivo plus azacitidine works. That is an effective regimen for upfront disease. We think that ENA plus azacitidine might be a little bit less resoundingly good. It didn't look like there's a survival benefit over azacitidine alone, but there are still high response rates. So the question on everybody's mind is why would you choose one of those instead of um, aza and venetoclax? And I think we can deliberate that a little bit. I think there are individual patient characteristics that may lead to one combination versus the other. But I think the most interesting part is that we were telling everybody, all of us on this call, on this kind of conference, although we didn't used to have to do Zoom, but we were all telling people, wait, calm down, wait for the mutational profile. AML doesn't have to be treated for everybody in five seconds. Let's apply our inhibitors. Certainly in the relapse setting, this is absolutely true. And the last thing you wanna be doing is pummeling on chemotherapy. But in the newly diagnosed patients, I think the question is, do you wait? Or do you say, well, venetoclax kind of fixes everything and then we'll see who didn't get fixed and deal with an inhibitor later. And I think that's kind of the, where we are right now for newly diagnosed patients who are older patients who are not going for, um, for intensive induction. 
I might interject though, that in the really unfit or the really elderly patients, I kind of want to know if they have an IDH mutation because I honestly would rather do HMA IDH if I have the choice. So I agree with you for the most part. I think, no, I think that's exactly what I was alluding to though, that in certain specific situations where you really don't think that the myelosuppression is gonna fly, might you wait for the IDH because both the single agent and the combination with venetoclax of the IDH inhibitors are less myelosuppressive. And, and actually Courtney presented some data that some of those people seem to recover counts faster actually. So I think those might be the right patients. The question is though, that how quickly are people getting their data back? And I think that is a major issue. Some people are getting ID, um, the IDH uh, data back quickly from PCR in 72 hours. Others are still taking two weeks. And I do think that, you know, two weeks of hanging around and waiting, you, one does have to be a little bit careful when you do have azaven as a potential compelling option. If the patient absolutely can't tolerate it, then you can wait.